self-replicating SCPs. There are lots of different ways of making an SCP threatening, from increasing its killing potential, to making it hard to stop, to simply making it harder to understand. One of the simplest ways of making a single SCP threatening is by giving it the ability to easily reproduce. Mostly this is a trickier issue for the Foundation to handle in containing it. When 1 becomes 2, 2 becomes 4, 4 becomes 8, and so on, the Foundation has to remain constantly vigilant, or things can quickly run out of control. We're going to take a look at a handful of self-replicating SCPs, not all of which are threats but all of which can make more, and more, and more of themselves. Let's begin with what is perhaps the most quintessential self-replicating SCP, 871. SCP-871 is currently a collection of 237 cakes, varying wildly in appearance and size, covering the entire range of foods described by humans as cake. The smallest observed so far was a mini cupcake, with the largest being a 22 kg Baumkuchen, measuring 2 meters in length. When any instance of 871 is consumed by a human or a collection of humans, it is replaced approximately 24 hours afterwards, with a similar cake appearing on a flat surface in the vicinity of the location where the previous instance was eaten. If any of the cakes are substantially damaged through any means other than human consumption, they will be replaced instantaneously. No negative effects have been observed to result from the consumption of these cakes, even in cases where several instances are consumed, excepting those expectable from eating large amounts of cake. The danger of SCP-871 stems from the consequence of these cakes not being eaten. Any instance of SCP-871 which is not consumed will cause a new cake to be created in the vicinity after 24 hours. These new cakes will share the anomalous traits of the other cakes, and since there is no known mechanism for halting this replication, any uncontained instances could replicate exponentially, quickly becoming unmanageable. The Foundation currently has no maintainable plans for the containment of more than 20,000 instances and it's estimated that an uncontrolled outbreak originating from a single cake would render the Earth uninhabitable within 80 days. Simple, but effective, and a great example of an SCP that can end humanity without being a terrifying monster or virus. Moving on, we have SCP-2009, the designation for all instances of an anomalous male humanoid capable of asexual reproduction by means of spores. These instances are genetically identical, and prior to mutation display no unusual physiology. Instances are fully sapient and capable of socializing normally up until they produce spores. They all identify themselves as Thomas Huang, and none of them exhibits knowledge of their anomalous properties. All of them also have a shared baseline of memories including childhood and early adulthood taking place in the community of Pollens B, California. No community by such a name, nor having any of the features they describe, is recorded to have existed. If any of the instances are exposed to temperatures of more than 20 degrees Celsius and humidity in excess of 40% for a period in excess of 5 days, they will seek out a darkened area, with preference given to tall buildings and places adjacent to high foot traffic areas. Their body will begin to distend and split into thin, chitin-based hairs, which it will use to anchor itself to nearby walls and objects, and if possible, draw limited sustenance from them. The instance will then cease sapient activity, converting all of its energy to the production of spores, continuing to produce and release them until it eventually dies of exhaustion. These spores are capable of infecting human beings, and the average instance will produce around 55 kilograms of them before expiring. The spores are airborne and can infect humans through the respiratory system. Within three to four days of exposure, individuals infected with them will begin to experience symptoms of nausea, lethargy, 
and photosensitivity. They will begin to shun social contact, isolating themselves from others. Within 5 to 8 days, their physiology will begin to change to match the other SCP-2009 instances, causing varying levels of discomfort proportional to the physiological similarities between the individual and SCP-2009. They are aware of the changes, and frequently exhibit extreme psychological distress during the process. Within 8 to 9 days of exposure, they will have become a new SCP-2009 instance, exhibiting no knowledge of their lives prior to transformation. SCP-2009 was discovered when reports of a widespread infection by a previously unknown disease in a town in Missouri were made to the CDC in 1998. Foundation agents embedded in the initial response team reported extreme physiological changes brought on by exposure to the spores in 46% of the town's residents. The town was immediately quarantined, with infected individuals taken into Foundation custody. The town was destroyed and incinerated under the cover of a story of freak wildfire. The CDC teams and uninfected residents were given amnestics, while all but three of the new SCP-2009 instances were incinerated, with the rest used for purposes of testing and study. During the destruction of the town, the desiccated remains of a 2009 instance were found in the bell tower of the first Methodist church in the town, and it's suspected that this was the original vector for the infection in the town although it's unknown whether it was the original instance. An interview was conducted with an infected individual, four days after exposure. The individual, an African female, complains about feeling awful, with symptoms of nausea and photosensitivity. She's asked to describe her earliest memory, which she says is from when she was five or six. Her mother had to work late, and when she got home she just kind of fell into a chair and fell asleep. The doctor asks her what her mother looked like in the memory, to which she says that she looked short, with kind of dark yellow skin and a round chin. After saying this, however, she questions herself, saying that that can't be right. The doctor ends the interview. Two days later, another interview is conducted where she says that she's not good, complaining that there's too much noise, like she's not herself, but she's people. She says that she's Thomas Huang. She knows she's Thomas Huang, but she keeps remembering stuff like her dad dying when she was a kid or getting a C in art class, but they're not her. She's from Pollensby, not Columbus, and her dad is still alive. She also remembers girl stuff, but stops herself from saying more. She says that she's comfortable with herself and everything, but asks if this is going to be a thing. The doctor tells her that everything is going to be fine within a day or so, and the interview ends. Shortly after, she finished her transformation into SCP-2009 and was promptly incinerated. The wonders of SCP never cease, with no explanation given for how exactly that whole process started. It could very easily run out of control though if the Foundation doesn't keep it locked down, although there's no telling how many more are still out there. Let's move on to something a bit different, with SCP-1661. 1661 has the rather rare object class of Archon, meaning an object that could be contained but would be disastrous if it was, so the Foundation leaves it mostly alone. 1661 consists of a swarm of self-replicating automata, composed primarily of aircraft components, assembled in a random and seemingly non-functional manner. Although the general arrangement and internal workings are highly variable between instances, each one contains a single, genetically cephalopodic eye of varying size in its approximate center. All of them are capable of self-directed flight through unknown means, and possess an aptitude for swift, coordinated maneuverability. While they display some degree of sapience, attempts at communication have been ineffective. 
Individual instances are highly specialized for a variety of purposes relating to the seizure and deconstruction of airborne crafts such as planes, drones, helicopters, and unmanned spacecraft. Laser cutters, multi-fingered appendages, and primitive cloaking devices have all been observed. They prefer to hunt collectively at night, attacking their target mid-flight. They are capable of completely deconstructing unmanned crafts and aerial drones in a matter of minutes, reducing such craft into scrap throughout freefall and before the craft could impact the ground. They generally limit themselves to removing non-vital components in manned crafts, thankfully, presumably to allow the survival of passengers. Experimentation has revealed that, in these cases, they are more cautious and precise with their work, taking as long as an hour to carefully remove specific material. They have shown no responses to prey items other than airborne devices. They first came to the Foundation's attention in 1948, following several reports of aircraft losing small exterior sections of their wings or fuselage. Some passengers aboard the flights claimed that they witnessed small metallic objects moving about the plane's exterior, thus prompting further investigation. A fictionalized account of these sightings were later disseminated to the public. Investigation into the projected hunting grounds of 1661 was fruitful, with several attacks on dummy planes being witnessed by field agents over the following decade allowing researchers to eventually triangulate the location of their nest. Containment specialists were deployed to the abandoned Albert Johnson Air Base in Indiana in April of 1969. Personnel there discovered over 300 instances in the process of configuring salvaged material into new instances. The majority were able to escape through collapsed sections of ceiling in the complex upon seeing the agents who managed to successfully capture several specimens for study. 47 inactive instances were also recovered, each of which did not possess their characteristic eye, hosting only open orbits within their central mass. Two instances were responsible for the rescue of an agent who had nearly fallen into a fissure in the foundation of the facility, and they were both then captured. Three days after their containment, a swarm of SCP-1661 descended within the site's exclusion zone, landing five meters from the main gates. They did not resist collection by personnel. An incident report from a couple of years later, however, states that all of the specimens began to display erratic behavior, such as flying around in circles and propelling themselves into the sides of their containment chambers. Four days later, personnel stationed within the area around their former nest began to receive reports of automobile crashes due to sudden onset seizures in the area, with first responders being equally affected. Two MTFs were dispatched, ones trained in memetic hazards and biohazards, but they became similarly affected when approaching within one kilometer of the airbase, despite protective equipment. Aerial reconnaissance was subsequently able to capture footage of a singular, massive organism emerging from the fissure beneath the base, consisting solely of transparent tendrils spotted with hundreds of eyes. Heavy bombardment of this entity as it reached beyond the confines of the base did no visible damage. Due to the large area of effect of the creature's hazardous abilities, the ineffectiveness of the Foundation's offensive, and the erratic behavior of SCP-1661 specimen, the decision was made by the site's director to release all of the 1661 specimen from containment. After doing so, they proceeded directly to their former nest, attacking the emerging entity via the excision of several dozen of its eyes. Efforts from the entity to ward off the attack were unsuccessful as the specimens proved far too quick to be struck by its tendrils. The entity withdrew into the fissure, disappearing completely. Personnel and civilians recovered immediately from its effects, and later inspection of the fissure revealed nothing out of the ordinary. No trace of this organism was found. 
Several non-functional 1661 specimens in containment were later delivered to the nest, where personnel were able to observe their activation upon the insertion of eyes collected from the hostile entity. SCP-1661 is thus formally considered the primary containment strategy for this entity. The Foundation can handle quite a bit, but sometimes I guess it's best to just let nature do its thing rather than play hardball. Giving up a few drones and planes once in a while is better than battling an eldritch abomination from the underworld. Continuing on with some self-replicating creatures, SCP-3199 is a species of sapient, category 5 biological entities of currently indeterminable origin, though tissue samples indicate the presence of silky chicken, chimpanzee, stoat, mussel, adder, and human DNA. They are typically hairless, stained with a thin layer of an albumin-like excretion and stand at an average of 2.9 meters. They weigh an average of 780 kilograms for a matured instance and 360 kilograms for a hatchling. Autopsy has determined that the cervical vertebrae of a mature instance are composed of cartilage rather than bone, enabling the neck and throat to twist and dislocate to around 340 degrees in either direction aiding their unusual reproductive cycle. SCP-3199 are opportunistic hunters, engaging with live subjects within a radius of 0.6 kilometers surrounding hatchlings that have not yet reached full adolescence. Their average speed is recorded at 25 kilometers per hour, and upon contact with human or animal subjects, they will proceed to kill them although the specifics of their methods are redacted from the record, outside of the process resulting in the liquefaction of internal organs and bone structures. A suitable cadaver is then transferred within range of the closest hatchling. SCP-3199 produces large eggs of an off-white color and rubber appearance. An egg will pass through the entity's digestive tract esophagus and eventually out via the mouth, followed by a viscous red substance, a highly corrosive material. The instances show extreme distress throughout the process, with personnel describing the sound as not dissimilar to a scream. There is no known limit to the number of eggs they're capable of producing, and the standing theory is that given enough time, a single instance could single-handedly perform an LK-class species transmutation scenario. The termination of a live instance can be achieved through a variety of equally effective methods, as they prove to be around as resilient as a standard human subject. Unfortunately, complete eradication has proven difficult, as all instances of SCP-3199, regardless of age, carry one egg within a specialized stomach-like organ upon birth, assuring that one living instance will persist through even ordinary means of constant and lethal assault. A single egg can bear a tremendous amount of resilience, maintaining its form and purpose even following continual subjection to extreme blunt force trauma, pressure exceeding 180,000 psi, high precision blades, and long-term acid exposure. The application of plastic explosives was considered but quickly rejected, as heat is a primary component in the growth and development of the eggs. The current containment protocols involve keeping all of the live instances in a solid block of transparent resin. The O5s eventually stepped in to halt all further experiments with the eggs, as the consequences of a containment breach became more and more apparent. The creatures were first discovered in Ireland, following witness reports of a bald creature crying like a banshee from within an undisclosed area of woodland. These reports resulted in the dispatchment of an MTF, who arrived on site with a total of 12 armed personnel. Two personnel were lost in action, their internal organs and jaws having been almost entirely dissolved. 
During transportation, the creatures produced two offspring, resulting in the deaths of a further six personnel. A later sweep of their initial recovery location was performed in an attempt to uncover the creature's origin and purpose. Local reports suggested that the small, remote residence in question had been abandoned for at least two decades. The sweep recovered several items of interest, including a bag of assorted thread and needles in various color and sizes, approximately 13 chicken carcasses with precise incisions located on the underbelly, neck, and thigh, six of them plucked with visible human teeth marks lining the bare areas at random intervals. Several containers, including water bottles and Tupperware boxes were found, holding an unidentified watery paste, deep brown in color, and in the presence of oxygen, it turned viscous and hard. A notebook was also found, heavily scratched with what was determined to be human fingernails, and with the words, New Breed Manifesto written on the front, along with two chicken feather quills. The notebook itself consisted of 24 pages of standard lined paper, written in black ink. 19 of these pages consisted of various cuboid patterns and crude, childlike illustrations vaguely resembling SCP-3199. On the remaining five pages, large lines for writing detail the diary of an unnamed individual. Much of the written script was illegible, but one excerpt in particular, dated as June of 1973, was written with notably higher clarity. The entry reads that, if you're reading this, then lucky you. 400,000 hours from now, and it'll be warm and wet and the wonderful versatility of inferior human DNA will birth a better era. A stronger era. One where food and water will be nothing but things of the past as we make and make and make more. The excerpt ends with the words, I really haven't much time, and that's why I envy you so much, as you'll have all the time you need. Time will be on and on, and death will be life. New life will be a part of life from now on. The final page of the notebook consisted of various ink blots, 13 instances of the word life in different sizes, two instances of the words want it, want, I want it, and the lyrics to the song Danny Boy in Old Gaelic Script. In the event of a containment breach of SCP-3199, the site is to be locked down and evacuated while it's flooded with clean, distilled water treated with dissolvable Class A sedatives. A surface team will then be dispatched to immediately retrieve any lingering instances of SCP-3199's eggs. Any living instance will be terminated on site, and their remaining eggs will be collected. All egg samples are to be transported to temporary off-site containment within a stable water bath. The site will then be drained and sanitized. There was some skepticism regarding these protocols, but apparently the creatures won't reproduce if surrounded by liquid, as they will only produce eggs into unoccupied space. In an interview log with the survivor of a containment mission, he says that they located the creature in a shack out in some woods. Due to being a late shift and wanting to get it done quickly, they breached the shack, resulting in the creature swiftly killing two rookies. The survivor had shot a large hole in its chest, and he mentions the awful screaming sound that it makes, remarking that whenever his infant son cries at home, it reminds him of that scream and that night. The doctor interviewing him recommends an amnestic be administered at the earliest possible convenience. Finally, we're given a few experiment logs done on the eggs, starting with heat exposure. After approximately nine minutes of high heat, the egg ruptured violently and produced a single hatchling which reached adolescence at an accelerated rate of 40 seconds. The now adolescent hatchling then produced two further instances of 3199, 
forcing on-site security to detain all three. Another experiment was done with extremely cold temperatures instead, and after two hours of exposure, the egg was placed under a hydraulic press. After 30 minutes at 9000 psi, cracks began to form on the egg, and it soon shattered. Egg fragments were collected and pressed into a fine pulp before being incinerated completely. It seems that some mad scientist in Ireland created a horrific new form of life by combining various animals, including chickens and humans. He apparently did this to make humanity into something better, but all he really did was give the SCP Foundation another chore. Moving on to something quite a bit different, SCP-2161 is a collection of approximately 85 million pages of self-replicating A4 paper, the majority of which are blank. A small proportion of pages contain letters, figures, or other markings, suggesting that it originally formed a single text. It spontaneously generates blank paper at a rate of approximately two pages per hour, several orders of magnitude slower than when first contained. Books or similar paper products brought into contact with the papers become subject to the same effect, their volume increasing through the generation of blank space, with any original text eventually spread across thousands of pages. It was first discovered at the former Adelaide home of Dr. Harper, Australian physicist and author, after neighbors complained of an abandoned house surrounded by large amounts of litter. Foundation contacts were alerted when government refuse workers reported the anomalous increase in paper volume. A related phenomenon is a computer virus, which increases the amount of white space in electronic documents in a manner similar to the papers. Any file to which an infected document is attached will itself become infected, but the infection is not evident in underlying code, suggesting an anomalous source. The virus was detected through the Foundation's scanning of the pages, and the inclusion of a photographic image in this document. We're given the results of the scan of the collection of papers, and at 5% complete, we're informed that an algorithmic recombination of scanned pages containing text or other marks suggests that the original document was some sort of technical documentation involving complex mathematics. At 10% complete, we're informed that scanning now indicates calculations and schematics for a faster than light interstellar vessel. The mechanics of travel are unclear, but textual fragments imply that the blank space generated in the papers and the virus may be an exhaust byproduct of the craft's propulsion system. Dr. Harper, the presumed author, is to be sought for questioning. Later, cameras in the warehouse containing the papers detected text appearing on new pages being generated, which has been collected and compiled. The text, in between large amounts of blank space, reads, I have traveled to the edge, watched it expand into nothingness. I have found no one, no other earth. I shall search on. It seems that Dr. Harper somehow managed to figure out faster than light travel and used his invention to take to the stars. He hasn't found much, but the exhaust from his anomalous engine is generating empty space on documents back here on Earth, for reasons that will probably never be made clear. Sometimes exploration is a lonely road. Finally, let's end with SCP-2679, the site of the Sleepy Oak Meadow Cemetery located 45 kilometers northwest of Victoria, British Columbia. The secondary component of 2679 are the graves that are found throughout the cemetery, with as many as three new instances of these graves to have been observed to emerge in a single day. Tombstones will extend upward from the soil, a process which takes 4 to 12 hours, varying in size and shape, but are otherwise non-anomalous. 
Each tombstone bears the name Jeanette Parslov. Coffins appear approximately one to four meters beneath each instance, and contain the remains of various organisms. To date, personnel have observed over 1,000 graves in the cemetery, with manifestations continuing to expand out from the center. Research into methods to prevent the emergence of additional instances is underway. One coffin contained the remains of an adult human female with a height of 1.62 meters and a mass of 45 kilograms. She had abrasions on her fingers and knuckles, and an inspection of her lung tissue indicated rapid onset of hypoxic hypoxia, meaning that she died due to a lack of oxygen. The presence of physical trauma indicates prolonged struggle before she died of hypoxia, and no record of DNA exists in the Foundation database. Another coffin contained another adult human female, height of 1.65 meters and a mass of 48 kilograms. This woman had acute albinism, meaning a lack of skin and hair pigmentation, with severe abrasions on her forearms, hands, and digits, and her fingertips were completely stripped of skin tissue. There's also the presence of numerous splinters under her fingers and toenails. This one also died due to lack of oxygen, and her DNA is a near identical match to the last one. Physical trauma, including significant interior damage to the coffin, suggests a prolonged struggle and possible self-mutilation. Another coffin contained an adult human of indeterminable sex, with a height of 1.72 meters and a mass of 53 kilograms. This one also had acute albinism, and lacked hair, visible genitalia, or secondary sex characteristics. Present across their body are severe abrasions and dermal avulsions, with several lacerations present along forearms and a fracture in their left radial bone. Additionally, both of their eyes had been forcibly removed. The internal examination showed that their internal reproductive organs are absent and their cranium had minor yet significant cephalic abnormalities. The pelvic bone was used to determine the person's sex as female, and lung tissue indicated rapid onset of hypoxic hypoxia. Laboratory data, however, showed that the person was male, but with an extra X chromosome, known as Klinefelter syndrome. The atypical presentation of the syndrome, however, led the individual to have a female skeletal system rather than male. The DNA is a close match to the last individual, and it's noted that the evidence suggests that the damage to the eyes was self-inflicted. Another coffin contained the remains of a human of indeterminable age and sex, with a height of 1.79 meters and a mass of 62 kilograms. This person also suffered from acute albinism, lacked hair, genitalia, or secondary sex characteristics, possessed additional knuckle bones, and lacked both of their eyes. Severe abrasions and lacerations are present across the subject's body, with numerous fractures and breaks present, particularly along the maxilla and nasal bone. Three teeth are broken as well. Their internal reproductive organs are absent, their frontal lobe is significantly smaller in size, and their amygdala is larger than normal. The pelvic bone is again used to determine the subject's sex as female, and their lung tissue indicates a rapid onset of hypoxic hypoxia. This person's genetic analysis, however, indicates a significant deviation from human DNA. It seems that internal damage to the coffin led to its collapse and the subject was crushed beneath the weight of the soil, preventing respiration. Evidence suggests damage to the face and jaw were sustained during repeated strikes against the coffin's lid. The last coffin were shown contained a bipedal humanoid, with a height of 1.95 meters and a mass of 89 kilograms. There's no discernible sex, age, or reproductive organs. They possess acute albinism and a lack of all hair. 
Extensive deformities are present and included, but not limited to, an expanded mandible, additional teeth, atypical dental morphology, elongated secondary phalanges, no eyes, and a recessed slash absent nasal dorsum. The subject has severe lacerations and dermal avulsions across its body, along with acute swelling in the abdominal region. Approximately 20 kilograms of soil were removed from its stomach and intestinal tract, and severe structural aberrations were found throughout the subject's skeletal, pulmonary, and central nervous system. The subject died due to asphyxiation, with evidence suggesting that they damaged the coffin lid till it collapsed and then burrowed upward for 20 minutes before succumbing to a hypoxia. When the cemetery was first discovered, nine non-anomalous graves were also found, all of which were exhumed for relocation. Of particular note was a tombstone with the following inscription. Jeanette Parslov. 1994 to 2014. Daughter, sister, mother, wife. You were far too young to lose your life. Whatever it takes, do what you must. Whatever the cost, come back to us. Upon exhumation, this grave was found to be empty. A person dying at a young age is always a tragedy. But what's happened here has definitely turned into something more horrific. It seems that Jeanette is forced to reappear again and again and again, and each time she changes a little bit, evolving to adapt to her situation to aid herself in escaping from her perpetual tomb. She's nearly reached the surface, but what happens when she begins to evolve to assist herself in defeating the Foundation? Self-replicating SCPs present themselves as a pretty clear and obvious threat, with the Foundation's intervention generally being the only thing preventing them from quickly running out of control. SCP-1661 is thankfully a beneficial SCP, protecting us from something really horrible, but the others could easily ruin humanity, or worse. The early days of SCP featured a fairly hefty number of self-replicating SCPs, but their quantity has died down a bit in later years to avoid overuse. After all, it's a pretty easy trick to make something more threatening. If one of something isn't scary enough, just make an infinite number of them. 